All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Nathan Roach, uh, and in collaboration with the other names on the screen here, uh, I've been working on reanalyzing Oxford Nanopore Technologies sequencing data uh, of SARS-CoV-2 samples within the framework of Galaxy. And I'm going to be talking about that today. So we're going to start with just an outline of, of what the talk uh, will be going into today. We're going to start with an introduction uh, on the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic and uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we're going to get into the variant calling workflow that we've been putting together for uh, calling genomic variants of, of SARS-CoV-2. And then we're going to get into some um, direct RNA sequencing analysis that some of my collaborators have been working on um, for calling RNA modifications within SARS-CoV-2 uh, and uh, you know, looking at RNA natively uh, in the sequencer. So just a brief introduction to COVID-19 and the pandemic that it's causing. Uh, I don't need to get into this too in depth, I don't think, as I'm sure you're all extremely well aware of, of the impact of COVID-19 and, and on the global community. Um, so, I mean, the vast majority of countries uh, in the world have confirmed cases at the moment. Uh, it is a massive public health crisis. Uh, and the numbers of infections and, and hospitalizations and deaths uh, continue to rise, uh, which is obviously, you know, extremely concerning. Uh, and so understanding the underlying biology and the under underlying epidemiology of this virus is really going to be critical uh, for understanding this, for, for um, uh, mitigating its spread, for uh, determining what treatments are likely to work and what treatments are likely to not work. And, uh, you know, hopefully for mitigating the likelihood of, of future outbreaks. So what do we actually know about the genome of SARS-CoV-2? This is the structure of the genome as we currently understand it. You have this leader sequence at the beginning. You have a number of open reading frames here. Uh, and this, this uh, RNA, this, this genomic RNA can be expressed uh, as well as a number of subgenomic RNAs can be produced. And these subgenomic RNAs have this leader sequence followed by one of the open reading frames um, present in the downstream virus, followed by the three prime UTR, which contains the downstream reading frames from that first open reading frame. Uh, and this is thought to um, uh, allow for increased expression of these, uh, of, of these you know, downstream open reading frames here. Um, so, this is going to be important, the, the subgenomic RNAs is going to be important for uh, the direct RNA sequencing that we're talking about here today. But important for us in terms of the variant calling that we've been working on is that variations in the genomic sequence in, in these open reading frames um, can lead to a number of things, right? So, so non-synonymous mutations within uh, these open reading frames can confer resistance to certain uh, drugs, can confer resistance to vaccines in, in theory, um, and so understanding how these mutations are occurring, where these mutations are occurring, uh, and, and whether these sites are under selection is gonna be really important. Uh, so why are we actually sequencing SARS-CoV-2? Well, for, for those reasons that I just listed. We wanna be able to look for patterns of selection within uh, the genomic sequence uh, to determine whether mutations are occurring, uh, if they're occurring, if they've, if they've independently occurred multiple times, and if it seems like they're uh, like they're under selection. Um, we want to determine regions that are more or less prone to mutations. So regions that are not going to be able to tolerate mutations as well are likely going to, are, are more likely to be functional uh, and therefore would probably make better vaccine targets, better drug targets, um, because if they can't tolerate mutations there, then, then, um, then the virus is unlikely to evolve uh, resistance to, to vaccines targeting those regions. Um, and we want to be able to look for co-infection events. So this is uh, actually quite a difficult thing to do um, with the current uh, technologies and the current um, uh, kind of standard protocol for, for sequencing these viruses. Um, but the idea here is that if a single individual or a single host gets infected by multiple strains of the virus, uh, we want to be able to detect that. We want to be able to detect at what ratio the different strains of the virus are present, uh, and then use that to um, you know, inform our understanding of the biology. And we want to be able to understand the underlying biology and epidemiology um, 
uh, you know, underlying this, this viral spread and, and uh, infection. Um, so how are we actually doing this? How are we sequencing this virus? Well, we're currently using Oxford nanopore technology sequencing. Um, so the theory behind nanopore sequencing is the following. You start with this pore embedded in a non-conductive membrane. Uh, you're going to apply a constant voltage across this pore uh, and measure the amperage as molecules of different size and shape interact with and pass through the pore. And what this looks like for a single stranded molecule of RNA or DNA is the following. Um, and what this uh, is going to result in is, is a series of characteristic uh, amperage levels depending on the series of K bases that are currently resting in the pore. And K varies depending on the pore model used and, and the, the chemistry and things like that. Um, but basically, you can then run this through a complicated machine learning model that is then going to predict the series of bases that best explains the amperage uh, uh, that is, is observed by, by this setup. Um, so as of uh, June 24th, uh, 2020, uh, there were over eight, uh, 8,200 um, sequences uh, of Oxford nanopore sequencing technologies um, data on, on the sequence read archive. So we need a way of analyzing all this data in a high throughput manner. We need a way of, of analyzing this data in a principled manner such that we can analyze you know, all the data in the same way. Uh, we need to be able to do this reproducibly so we know what parameters were set. Uh, and, and our solution to that is that we're gonna use a Galaxy framework, um, a Galaxy workflow for doing this. So what does this Galaxy workflow look like? Uh, well, we're gonna start with a list of, of the Oxford Nanopore Technologies accessions um, from the sequence read archive. We're gonna download the corresponding sequencing data from the sequence read archive using uh, faster queue dump, which is provided by SRA Toolkit. Uh, we're gonna trim adapters from those sequences using PoreChop, which is an adapter trimming tool designed for nanopore technologies uh, data. Uh, just as a quality assurance check, we're gonna do um, quality control uh, plots uh, for each one of these uh, trimmed, adapter trimmed uh, sequences. Uh, this is done using a tool called Nanoplot, which generates things like uh, quality score versus read length and, and other plots of that nature that are, uh, can be quite informative. Um, we're gonna map all of these adapter trimmed reads to the SARS-CoV-2 genome using Minimap2. Uh, which is kind of the gold standard aligner for long read, uh, long reads at the moment. Um, this step is just restructuring the data. Um, so if we don't restructure the data like this um, into a collection of collections, then the Madaka consensus will collapse a single level, level collection um, into a single file uh, instead of uh, uh, a, instead of a single HDF5 file for each BAM file, it would just produce a single HDF5 file for all of the BAM files. So we need to we need to restructure the data into a collection of collection to prevent that from happening. So that's our current workaround. Um, from there, we're running Madaka consensus, which generates a list of um, kind of structured probabilities of a given base at a given position. Uh, we're feeding that into Madaka variant, which is going to call the um, the variance from those, those probabilities um, or from those likelihoods. Um, and uh, these variants out of Madaka variant, um, I'll get into this in a bit, but they're not, um, they're not particularly well annotated. And so this is currently throwing a wrench in later steps in the pipeline. So uh, one of the things that is the holdup here is that I've, I've been working on um, modifying the Madaka variant to include a script that allows for uh, reporting of allele frequency for the given variants, for depth of sequencing of the given variants, uh, strand bias of the given variants, things like that. Uh, and that's currently being integrated into Galaxy and hopefully we'll have that up soon so that this workflow will uh, you know, have everything we need in it. Uh, we're then annotating the variants that get called out of Madaka variant using a tool called SNPF that just uh, annotates like is this a missense variant? Is this a nonsense variant? Uh, is it uh, a frame shift? Things like that. Um, and then we're going to extract out the fields that we care about in this VCF and, and report it in a tab uh, delimited file, just for easier um, handling and later steps in the, in the analysis. Um, 
this step is currently failing because as I said, the Madaka variant step doesn't fully annotate the variant. So that's, that's what we're working on now is, is making sure that all the things that we're trying to extract out of this VCF file are there. Um, and then we're gonna collapse down this uh, into a single file that we can then use to generate um, you know, downstream analysis. So what does the downstream analysis look like? Um, this is kind of the, some of the stuff that we've generated out of the Illumina sequencing that, that has been being developed in parallel to this. And uh, this is the kind of thing that we can generate out of, uh, out of the nanopore once we have the workflow up and running. So the idea here is that you have like allele frequency on one axis, uh, position on the other axis, and then you, you label whether it's a, a missense, nonsense variant, et cetera. Uh, and you get a sense of where these variants are kind of tolerated uh, at, at a given allele frequency, where they're not tolerated, uh, things like that. Um, so just kind of the highlights, we've got a framework for, for calling variants in, in a galaxy uh, that we're working on, we're actively developing and, and hopefully we'll, we'll finish soon. And work is kind of ongoing to finalize all this. Um, kind of switching gears, we, we've also been working on developing um, direct RNA sequencing workflows. So uh, the, some of the other people on this talk, um, Bjorn and Milad and, and um, others, uh, have collected uh, three uh, replicates of direct RNA sequencing from cultured uh, SARS-CoV-2 in um, a human lung cell line. And uh, this, this workflow is just assigning these direct RNA sequencing reads to the different subgenomic RNAs that uh, I described earlier. Um, once we have those subgenomic RNAs, I, I won't go into the details of this workflow because it's massive and, and it would take a long time. Um, once we have those subgenomic RNAs collected out, we feed it into a tool called Tombo, which does um, kind of comparisons between the amperage signal of uh, in vitro transcribed RNA versus um, in vivo sample RNA and looks for uh, regions where those amperage signals are different uh, and uses that to say this is likely a modified uh, base because this, the amperage signal is different enough that it must be a different, um, different re electrical resistance that's being applied here uh, within the pore. Um, so, you know, I, again, I won't get into all the details of this workflow, I'm running out of time here. Um, but uh, the kind of output here is that we get uh, patterns of modification. So, that, you know, these are the different replicates of, of, uh, of the sequencing or of this modification calling um, in the different subgenomic RNAs that we're interested in. And you can see that there's some regions where there's pretty clear modification happening or, or pretty strong modification happenings, which is, which is pretty neat that we can identify this. Um, so this is actively in development and we're working on kind of uh, getting this continuous signal into in the more discrete calls of like this, ba this base is frequently modified, things like that. Um, so these workflows are actively being developed, but they're, they're largely established. Um, we're working on getting something out publication wise shortly. By the time this talk airs, hopefully it'll be out. Um, patterns of modification are being detected and, and we're quite happy about that. Um, so just on to modification, sorry, on to acknowledgements. Um, I want to thank uh, BCC for inviting me to talk today. I want to thank all the people that I've worked on this project with, including Anton, Milad, Florian, Stefan, um, Bjorn, uh, and others. I want to thank everyone in the Galaxy community. Um, I'm, I'm relatively new to this community, but I'm, I'm just so um, blown away by the amount of time and effort and, and uh, just the community in general. And I want to thank my new employer, Galaxy Works, um, uh, for providing me a job and, and the opportunity to work on things like this. Um, so thank you, uh, and I will be around in the Q and A for any questions that you might have. Uh, thanks.